maintenance done sooner, or was it inevitable that this was going to happen? I think the, the, the maintenance, of course, could have been uh, abated with time. I think you could always postpone, but the inevitable would have been that the building uh, was not efficient in terms of the use of single drains, windows. I think it would have been a recurring problem, and you'd always be maintaining. Mm -hmm. And uh, the bridges, of course, in my mind, could have been saved. I think if we, if the, years ago, if we would have taken the wood off and come up with another material. But I think just the fact that we had those two married together, it would have been a recurring problem. Uh, we, regardless of maintenance or not, because I, I'm really proud of the fact of how well the facilities department maintains their buildings here, so I'm a little sensitive to the question. But uh, I think inevitably something would have had to happen. The windows would have had to change to uh, probably a aluminum system uh, with at least an uh, improved glazing. If not this one, it would have been simple. Yeah. I think historically one of the issues would have been how, how was the financing put together and what were the limitations that were placed on the architects in terms of the uh, budget that was set. I mean, I, I know just having glanced through some correspondence at the archive yesterday that putting together a financing package really concerned President Norman and may have been a factor. But I can't think of a harder use group than students. Uh, and I say that in for 40 years, also having three children. I mean, we you know soon we renovated our apartment in New York where I had to start doing, doing damage control when they were younger. And um, I'm glad they're all sort of reaching college age now, who are college, so we can come in and do our own group run and maintenance. <laughs> well, I mean, I was going to say one thing, and uh, what I didn't point it out, but looking at it through all the drawings, it was quite remarkable. Uh, obviously, you had the three, the three door buildings built first, and Harriet came a few years later. When it finally came time to build the final door, the architect himself was rethinking the process mm -hmm. because there's actually uh, bit alternates in there to, to look at a different way to construct the building, look at different finishes. We had aluminum windows as possible as a bit alternate. Uh, you had concrete block as possible for the uh, exterior walls on how to put it together. Uh, think about it, you're only doing one building, so is there really the need to do the mass production anymore? And uh, so the fact that the architect of the time is considering it acceptable to use aluminum, it just made it a little easier for us to make that, make that jump. So that was, I think it was quite interesting the fact that they did have the, that option in there. And the, 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 obviously they were looking at their own building that was already built rethinking well what worked and what didn't work. And I think it's a sign of the right time. He's able to reevaluate and change. And so, yes. Were you actually able to accomplish this in the three months? Absolutely. It was done through uh, the White's company and they worked double shifts. Uh, they started uh, they cheated a little bit of time in on you know, for students during the months of April, what have you, but really uh, after graduation in May to the first day of school, they worked day in, day out, and some weekends through the weekends. And the double shifts, it was literally an ant farm. At one time, there was like 10 different lifts going on in these buildings. I've never seen uh, so many trains interjected into one construction site in my life. Uh, I told Ben Bruns, the project manager, that uh, I've never been so proud of work on our project. It's been the hardest project to walk away from and leave. It's so enjoyable. But it's also set the standard for me when construction starts. I expect that now from all contractors. You should be able to do it. These guys did. Yeah, yeah but they met the goal. They did a really good job. Were they the original contractor? Yes. Yeah. The, uh, you mentioned the, the fourth dorm that they did differently. The windows in that had to be replaced earlier, though. What, what, what's the story behind that? Well, it was, I think it was a, a retrofit after the fact. It probably happened in the late 70s. One of those deals where all the old ladies went and working on us do something else. It was interesting. They just covered up the old windows. Yeah, so when we started taking out that window, oh gee, there's still the original window underneath it. Mm -hmm. and so, the frame was still there. Yeah, oh. yeah, nothing in place. And obviously, with the vertical divide, the, the, the appearance of casements, I think that's totally the wrong, the wrong choice to be doing. But they had an idea, just to crack it wasn't that you execute it properly. The other question I actually, more interesting question I have the color palette that, that was originally chosen was that sort of battleship gray. Is it something that is not, was just economically not possible to reproduce? How, how did you choose to darken it? The, uh, the color of the exterior channels and the, 
other elements. There's actually on the building what I could find was that uh, as you scrape through paint, get to the bottom layer, you want to find what is there. Uh, we found different colors. Believe it or not, uh, there are some, some railings that are painted the, the infamous green that you found back in the, the mid-50s or so. We were finding entrances around doors painted uh, the bottom color uh, a different color. And I know that what you're talking about is the channels themselves, which is that, that nondescript gray color. Uh, you got to the point where we were looking to be able to unify the building because we knew we were changing out the windows, and so how do you do that? And so the best we could think of is to bring it back to its original flavor of this shade of darker would be just to make it more monolithic than this darker color. So again, that's a, that's a choice. Well, it echoed what had to be done in the days, too. I mean, pitch and angle were originally the same. Same challenge. Right, yeah. Were the bridges part of Sarnin's design? Yes. Yeah. If you have a chance today, if it's not a bad day to walk out on it, even, even as replacement players, they are wonderful. The experience is remarkable. Uh, even the Quad Creek below is no longer the water feature. Uh, just to walk across and to enter into the building, you can envision yourself as a student, as I remember, being able to go from point A to point B. You literally leave the academic behind you and you go home. It's the neatest feeling. And, and it works. I mean, it's, uh, maybe I can ask a student, okay. Former students, does, does it feel that way or not? You just think it's just cold and windy. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think it feels that way. Does, does it work? Yeah. Good. That's what's important. What was the water feature discarded or not, not discarded, but why is it no longer there? Well, just speaking with the facilities folks, it's my understanding that it had it's just long-term maintenance issues that happened with time. And uh, it was just a decision that was made to make it go away. Now, in my mind, my mind I just, for some reason, in my youth, I, I remember the water feature. But who knows what I was remembering back then? <laughs> but uh, it was uh, an incredible uh, element to be interjected right in the middle of the campus. And uh, I'm not sure how well they received bringing the water feature back. I didn't feel that I knew the answer. <laughs> I have a related question. Um, it sounds like you're about to begin work on the dining hall. Cool. Is there any possibility that the Stuart Davis mural could be brought back? Yeah, uh, that conversation has come up. That obviously, the mural is uh, quite valuable. Uh, as a student, it used to be in a dining hall. That's where it was. That's how I remember it. Uh, it the work there at the time, just because the, the dining hall uh, has changed since then. The south half is no longer as it used to be. And uh, so the fact that I think the configuration is different, they probably won't have a logical home back in the day as it did before. I've got a question for Jason about the, um, the chapel and the replacement of that skylight. Um, I noticed from the original uh, design there was a Latin cross on the top of that. I'm wondering if. That was a theological consideration, the shift away from the disciples' relationship, or if that was a cross thing? I don't know if I can answer the entire story of it, but the cross had come off during a roof replacement of that building that I'm not exactly sure what year it was. It was in the, I think it was in the, in, the, um, in the late 70s or the early 80s that the cross had come down. Um, and uh, the, the, the story, as I understand it, was the, the cross uh, uh, was lost. Um, and uh, because there was no evidence of it, I, when it came to putting the building back together, it was on a list of items, you know, that that was a, a restoration item. But only being able to get halfway through the list meant that we were, you know, it was integrity was such a, an issue that it was below any of the things that we could get to. But there's also, of course, just a discussion about why it left in the first place and, and what sort of signal that might send. You know, are we, do we say that it was a piece of the historical fabric of the campus and so we can view it like that, or is it a symbol for something that would be, feel exclusive for a non-denominational chapel? So those discussions happened, but because we didn't have the money to do it, they were somewhat academic in the, in the most sort of literal sense. Um, so, uh, you know, should it come back at some point? You, know, you see those original renderings of it, you would like to say that it could come back and not offend anyone, but that's
that's a, it wasn't my decision to make uh, that, that particular call. I know there's been a lot of discussion about it, though. And a question for Jennifer, which is about, so you talked about the, the shifting um, housing patterns for students, the neighborhood, and then on campus, and um, that, that still seems to be, um, you know, students live in both areas now. I wonder if there was a similar trajectory in terms of businesses <coughs> in the neighborhood, whether, you know, the development of that residential area and the university brought businesses that then followed us, there was a similar cycle. Um, there certainly has been, you know, a revitalization of that business district, but whether that, that was part of that same, that same story. Yes, um, Drake did plat, the university did plat the downtown area, those were 20 foot lots that were platted and sold. And so that um, was you know, part of the plan, really, to have a residential area and then a separate business district. And that separation has been fairly maintained. Um, as far as the, the businesses, looking at older photos, the, the downtown area is just bustling. Part of it was that students were using transit, mass transit, and coming in from their homes. I think there was more of a commuter campus um, in the 40s and 50s, certainly, and prior. And also, the student union was very small and minimal, and so there were a lot of um, lunch places that were serving students. Um, the dining hall was minimal. The number was 120 students that could be seated at the um, women's dormitory. So there was much more of a need for, for that type of Business and also, I mean, it's just a different time. So there are a lot of drug stores and hardware stores and, and those types of businesses. And some of the nature of the businesses changed when there were fewer homeowners. Initially, there were a lot of businesses that were catering to the needs of a homeowner that was needed to keep up a house. And when you have students that are, you know, keeping up the house somewhat and a landlord keeping up somewhat, you know, you don't need those same kinds of businesses. So. Changes and shifts, and now the university owns some of those business spaces too, and so that has changed the nature of what space is available for businesses to be there. I don't know if that addresses. Yes, thank you. I just wanted to ask each panelist for maybe your thoughts on instead of looking back, kind of like at the end of the show yesterday, saying, you know, now looking forward. Uh, or looking at current things that have happened on campus, the addition of the Agora, the time element, the new residences. Um, you know, what are your thoughts about how do those buildings tie into or not tie into the campus, the campus plan, and also projecting to if we're going to build you know, a new building, a new science building that's kind of on the slate as something of interest, citing that. Uh, how do you, you know, should that be something that we try to tie into the past, or do we just say, no, it's now and, and move, you know, move forward? And, um, what are your thoughts on campus planning now? Well, I guess the question would be whether Drake actually had a master plan at its early stages, and what, what was the what was the concept that drove it? I mean, different campuses have different contexts and um, have some directions that hold over time. Um, I, you know, I was for 20 years at Rice University, which had a plan that was drawn up in 1907 by Ralph Adams Cram, and um, it has really held incredibly well over time in terms of the introduction of new disciplines, uh, the sciences have changed radically, um, the, the whole thing about campus living, campus life, dormitory living, and so on has obviously gone through a lot of uh, change. <coughs> so it's, it's whether that vision can be, can be held. I think that, that Morris sort of discussed it a bit in the catalog as to what the, uh, what the intentions were and, and how they put up. They've been met. As far as Drake is concerned, it's been 10 years since I've been here. The weather's been so nice lately that I honestly haven't gotten around to see it very much. Um, but I, and I, don't, I think you really have to address it every time you do a building program that um, is meant to meet new needs. You should always be looking at it holistically in terms of how it relates to the, the bigger idea, which is a combination of landscape, 
space and social dimension. They should reinforce each other. Yeah, I mean, in terms of the Drake plan, um, you know, when, when Harry Reese's office came and did their buildings subsequent to the original Santa buildings, they held fairly clearly true to the original plan. You know, there was some sort of primary center space and then the axes that ran through it that terminated in the smaller scale. So it was kind of a breakdown of larger community, community to smaller scale spaces. And different building additions over the years have more or less held to that that scheme. Um, it was all, it always drove me crazy, I gotta say, when I, I lived just south of the campus for a while when I first uh, moved to Des Moines. And you know, in what was the grand entry to the Drake campus, there was the Drake hedge, right? And then a parking lot, which seemed really awful in terms of, of what that was. And and you know, uh, to to fit into the plan and sort of su sort of suppress your individual desires to the overall plan has been has been variously successful. I know there's a new plan that ZGF, the Zimmel Guns or Frasca did. Uh, and I don't know exactly how how much you know that fits with the plan, but some things have been more and less successful. From my opinion, I would rather see at least the essence of that plan continued in to the way the edges are held and the way the axes and the spaces break down in scale to run through. And, uh, and, and some of those have been much less successful than others, but I would rather see that original plan or a version of that original plan transformed into what happens in the future. Yeah, actually, the, the, the plan that you just mentioned is, I think, was under quite sure to over the confluence of landscape architectural firms and the redesign of the north south connection and also through Payne Street. It's all part of the master plan process. I know there's a whole new spot of the Meredith parking lot. I still call that as the Homestead lot now. <coughs> Possibly for the future, I think it might be for education. And I know there's thoughts in terms of uh, the library expanding uh, as part of the master plan process. So there's long range thinking going on on this campus in terms of how to make yourself better. And uh, we, hopefully, we, a lot of us that will be around for years to come will be able to see it happen. Uh, to me, the one thing I'd like to see is have something happen fairly soon it would be actually in the parking lot somehow to get the cars out of the middle of the campus and they bring back the green space again. So that's just one of the things. I've been very excited the fact that there's been due diligence that they truly are trying to follow the step by step the process. And I think that's important so she just not get the mess. And for myself I, I am a second generation along through my, my husband and my uh, husband's family. And so they have a lot of pride in, in the campus, and that's how we came to live in the neighborhood. And um, so it's it's been exciting to see the development of more student housing. Um, that was one of the things that struck us when we moved here, coming from Milwaukee, um, and from kind of, kind of our campus experience had been very much everybody wanted to live around campus, and wanted to, to be around campus. And here it was pretty much you came from out of town, you might live in West Des Moines. This feel. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's really exciting for students to have that opportunity and, and for graduate students too, coming in. Um, you know, law school attracts students from you know, outside of the, of the state and to have that ability to form community, you know, community in the dorms. Um, just much like the book that I read, I think that really is true. There's something about having student housing and, and a focus for the campus where the community gathering together. Um, you know, it really provides part of, of uh, an enriching experience that just isn't there when, when everyone is just scattered. Um, so I think that's that's very exciting. And, and one thing that um, my husband had, was invited to participate as a community member in the, the planning process, and I think that's an exciting addition to it. I don't know the history as far as inviting community in, but that was a, you know, it's true, the old the movie saying that you build it and they will come. Uh, the next summer, uh, after the completion of the first two dorms, enrollment skyrocketed. We were trying to find places on campus for additional students. The next year, the same happened. And uh, I think that's a real tribute to the fact that people do understand and they do perceive and they do see the difference in quality. And uh, just as we all do, that's why you're here today, because you understand quality when you see it. Obviously, the parents are seeing the same thing. Well, I want to thank all of the speakers for their participation. This was a really stimulating morning of talks.